Our text this evening is Psalm 32, 6 and 7. For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place, thou shalt reserve me from trouble, thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Psalm 32 is David's personal testimony. It's the testimony of a man who fell into terrible sin. And we saw last night in the previous verses how David was chastised by God because of that sin and especially because he walked impenitently in that sin for a long period of time. God's heavy hand was upon him. His bones waxed old. He was roaring in anguish, and his moisture turned into the drought of summer. And that chastening hand, which was upon David for all of those months, finally brought David to repentance. And then God freely and immediately forgave him. And thou forgivest, end of verse 5 the iniquity of my sin. And now that time of painful chastisement under the hand of Jehovah has passed. Now David can rejoice in God's mercy, which brings us back to verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Forgiveness of sins, together with the assurance of that forgiveness, is so precious that David wants everyone who reads this psalm and everyone who sings this psalm to know all about it. At the end of verse 5, David pauses that word, Selah. You may have wondered why do we have that word Selah to write the psalms. That is a musical notation. You are not necessarily supposed to read it as you read the Psalms. It means pause. Pause, take a deep breath, and think. Think about what has just been written. Thou forgivest the iniquity of my sin. And so when you read the Psalms, you pause when you come to the seal of now David reaches a conclusion at this point. Verse 6, for this, or because of this, or on account of this, or for this reason, everyone that is godly shall pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Because God is the kind of God that David has described, a God who freely pardons those who come to him sorry for their sin and confessing that sin to him. Because God is that kind of God, everyone who is godly shall pray unto him. Because God is a pardoning God who is rich in mercy, he shall be sought and he shall be found. The lesson here is, there is mercy with Jehovah God. He is the one who receives back the prodigal, the one who has been wandering in the paths of sin for many months, almost a year. He receives the prodigal back when the prodigal comes in the way of repentance and confession. And David says to us in this psalm, do not fear to come to Jehovah God. Do not fear that Jehovah God will not receive you if you come in the way of repentance and confession of sin. He will. Turn from your sin. Even if your sin is so terrible as my sin was, adultery and murder, turn from your sin and you will find Jehovah merciful as I did. His hand may chasten you for a time and you may feel the pain of that chastisement. But finally, he will shelter you from the storm. And that's what David has learned 
And that's what David would teach transgressors in this text. Jehovah, the penitent's hiding place. Jehovah, the penitent's hiding place. Notice, what, from what, and how. Verse 7 contains a beautiful confession. Thou art my hiding place. David has found a hiding place, a refuge in Jehovah his God. And that idea of hiding place is a very beautiful idea. First of all, a hiding place is a shelter or a refuge from danger. The figure here is of a traveler who sees a storm approaching. Or a traveler who sees a wild animal, say a lion or a bear, or sees an enemy coming toward him. What you need at that particular moment in time is a hiding place. You need somewhere where you can find shelter, somewhere dry and warm and safe. And David, in his life, had had many different hiding places where he had often been on the run. Read of that in his wife, that he was often in caves in the earth. Or sometimes his friends or acquaintances would give unto him refuge and shelter. And that same word is used in 1 Samuel 19, verse 2, where Jonathan says to David, Take heed to thyself until the morning, and abide in a secret place, and hide thyself. A secret place. Now David confesses. He has a hiding place, a place of protection. And happy is the man who, when he sees danger approaching, can say, I have a hiding place, and he can hide himself there. Second, a hiding place is a hidden, secret place where a man can hide, and his enemies will not be able to find him. If a man is seeking refuge from the enemy or from a wild beast his hiding place must necessarily be a secret place somewhere where no one else can find him even the children know this if you're playing hide and seek your hiding place must be somewhere where no one else can find you otherwise it is not much use as a hiding place and that's why this word is often translated in the bible Secret. We saw that in 1 Samuel 19, verse 2. Take thyself, take heed to thyself until the morning, and abide in a secret place and hide thyself. Or Judges 3, verse 19. I have a secret errand unto thee, O king. And with that idea, idea of secrecy comes the idea of intimacy, a place of sweet fellowship where a man can be alone with his friend without fear of being discovered or disturbed. It's really a covenantal idea. And Jehovah God is for David a hiding place, a refuge, a shelter, a hidden secret place, a place of intimate and sweet fellowship, and much more besides all of this, Jehovah God is to David. David does not say there is a hiding place or let me recommend to you any number of possible hiding places but Jehovah is my hiding place. There is only one hiding place. Not two, not three, one. And Jehovah is the only hiding place that David has. The gods of the heathen worshipped by the surrounding nations, they are not hiding places. The arm of flesh, whether a party, or a prince, or a king, they are not hiding places either. Wealth, and power, and influence, these are not hiding places either. Only Jehovah God is the hiding place. For who but Jehovah can offer protection? Who is strong like Jehovah? Who is wise like Jehovah? And if Jehovah has hidden David from all of his enemies, who could possibly find him? And who could possibly then 
destroy him. Could famine, or pestilence, or the sword, or even the devil himself be able to find David when Jehovah has hidden him in the hiding place? Because Jehovah is the perfect hiding place. He is the all-sufficient, unchanging, faithful covenant God of Israel. This Jehovah is the God who is the covenant God, the friend of Israel, the friend of all true Israelites, and the friend of David, the God who loves his people, the God who cares for his people, and the one who has sweet fellowship with his people in Jesus Christ. The God who is intimate with his people, who shares his secrets with his people and causes them to know that he is God, that he is good. They taste and know that Jehovah is their God. And this explains the great confidence in David's words. Thou art my hiding place. Not the hiding place of others only. Not there is a hiding place for some, but thou art my peculiar and particular hiding place. I have that confidence, says David. I have hidden myself in Jehovah God. And happy is the man who can say not only there is a hiding place, but he is my hiding place. I hide myself in him. And here we have a beautiful confession which is in stark contrast to what he said in the previous verses. When David was walking in the way of sin, when he was impenitent, and when God's hand of chastisement was upon him, he did not confess, Thou art my hiding place. Rather, he said, that God's hand was heavy upon him. He felt crushed. He roared in deep anguish, and his joy and his peace, his confidence and his assurance, all of it dried up under God's hot displeasure. And we saw last time, as we looked at those verses, that God did that for David's own good. To use the figure, David had wandered away from the hiding place. He had wandered foolishly into terrible danger. He had left the safety of the shelter, which is Jehovah God. He had refused to live in covenant fellowship with God, which involves living a life of holiness before God. And now God, by means of chastisement, brings him back into that hiding place. But during those months of chastisement, David could not make this confession, Thou art my hiding place. But now as a penitent, sorry sinner, who has been forgiven all of his sins, and rejoices in that forgiveness in the words of verse 1, now he comes to God. He flees to God and hides himself in God. We learn from this psalm, therefore, that there is a way back to the hiding place. Sometimes God's people foolishly leave the protection of Jehovah their God and seek to find their own way in the world, only to discover how foolish they have been. But God leaves, as it were, the door open for them to return. He calls his people to come back to himself and to hide themselves in him. And now David, having experienced this for himself, calls all godly people to pray to God and to hide themselves in Jehovah. Remember, as we said before in this series, that this is a psalm of teaching. Now he's teaching us that there's hope for the backslidden sinner, the one who comes in the way of repentance, turns from his sin. There's hope for that sinner. No matter how dreadful his fall may have been, and how long he has wandered and wallowed in that sin, he will find Jehovah a hiding place, a safe refuge of forgiveness in the way of his confession and turning away.
away from his sin. David did, and so will so will we. And David says, as it were, I was foolish. I forsook my hiding place. Jehovah was always my hiding place, but I forsook him for a while. I made myself an easy prey to the enemy of my soul. But the Lord, he took me back. Thou forgivest the iniquity of my sin, and then that deserves a long pause, a long intake of breath. He did. He forgave my sin. And now I want to tell everyone, first of all, stay in the hiding place. Stay in sweet, intimate fellowship with God. Live as God's friend. Walk humbly before God. Rely on His protection. And if you should, as I did, foolishly wander away into sin, come back. Come back even if you've been sinning for months and months. Come back. Do not fear to come back. God will forgive. That's the lesson here. A beautiful truth. God will forgive the penitent. The penitent can find a hiding place in Jehovah God. And to give us an incentive to trust in Jehovah God as our hiding place, he underlines how secure this hiding place is. He underlines it and he rejoices in it. He wants us to see it and to understand it so that we too will hide ourselves in Jehovah our God as David has hidden himself in Jehovah his God. That everyone who is godly, as he says, might have confidence to hide themselves in him. To be in Jehovah's hiding place is therefore to experience deliverance. Verse 7 says that God shall compass me or surround me or encircle me with songs of deliverance, which means songs of escape. We will escape from danger by running into the hiding place, which is Jehovah our God. Notice, it's not that the child of God has no afflictions or has no dangers or trials in life, but rather he is delivered out of them. He escapes out of them. To see that, just look briefly at the life of David. Here is a man who confesses that Jehovah God is his hiding place. Did that mean that David had a simple easy, carefree life? No. He was in constant danger. When he was a young man, he was threatened by that Philistine giant Goliath. But God delivered him then. When he was a bit older, he was threatened by the ungodly king Saul. But David always found that God was his hiding place and always protected him. And after this psalm, in a few years after this psalm, his ungodly son Absalom will rise up in rebellion against him. And again, he will be forced to flee from Jerusalem for his life. And yet he will be able to say, Jehovah is my hiding place. He protects me. He compasses me about with songs of deliverance. For it does not mean you will have no trials in your life. Do not expect, as a Christian, to have a life without trials, without tribulation and suffering. In fact, expect, expect much tribulation. Paul said we must, through tribulation, enter into the kingdom. Expect to lose much for the sake of Jesus Christ. Expect that friends and family will forsake you for the sake of Jesus Christ. Do not be fooled by the health and wealth gospel, therefore, who say you should live in victory, you should have financial prosperity all the time, your health should be perfect all the time. Don't expect that. If that's the kind of person you are, you don't require 
are highly placed. A travelling man does not think much of a hiding place until a storm approaches or until he meets a lion or a bear. Then he's interested in a hiding place. And the Lord makes us aware of our need for himself to be a hiding place and causes us to appreciate this hiding place when we have it, when he sends storms into our life and afflictions. Then we know, yes, Jehovah is my hiding place. We would not be able to confess Jehovah is our hiding place, but for the storms of life that God sends upon us. And this deliverance is ongoing. He continues to be our hiding place, he says in this psalm, Thou shalt preserve me. Verse 7. That word preserve means to act as a guard, standing watch over someone or something which he holds to be precious to him. And who therefore could possibly fear when Jehovah stands as a guard and encircles us with his protection? Jehovah himself is standing watch, as it were, over this hiding place. It suggests vigilance on Jehovah's part. Another psalm says that he that keepeth Israel shall not slumber nor sleep, and no enemy and no devil will be able to slip through the back door, as it were, of this hiding place and disturb the safety of the child of God when God is not looking, because God is always looking. And although the future will not be any less troublesome than the past has been, Jehovah will always be the same, the unchanging, faithful God who shall, notice, shall preserve me. And so secure is this hiding place that David can say that he is surrounded or compassed about or encircled with songs of deliverance. Now in poetry you can have several ideas which almost seem to contradict one another. On the one hand we have a place a hiding place, a secret, intimate place of seclusion where no one else can find us. And on the other hand, we have songs of deliverance. And these songs are ringing cries, shouts of triumph. The kinds of shouts that an army will make when it has victory in the battle. Not quiet, subdued songs, therefore. And who is singing? In this verse, two possibilities. Either David is singing because God has caused him to sing for joy because of God's deliverance of him, or God himself is singing in triumph because he delights in the salvation of his people. The Bible talks about God rejoicing over his people. The point is, wherever David turns to the left, to the right, backwards or forwards, he is surrounded not by hostile armies, not by wild beasts, not by terrible dangers, but by songs of deliverance. And these songs announce to David and celebrate with David that David has been delivered from all of his dangers. They announce and celebrate peace and joy and forgiveness of sins. These songs are about God's power and his grace and his mercy. And whatever way David turns, these songs are echoing in his heart and in his conscience. And the enemy can do nothing to silence these songs. You can picture for yourself the devil. And he can hear these songs and he is disgusted and annoyed by these songs. And as it were, he wants to put his finger in his ears to drown out these songs, but the devil can do nothing to silence the songs of deliverance. Your celebration, a festival, atmosphere, merriment and joy, and only God's covenant friends, men and women and children like David who belong to 
to Jehovah God. Only they are, are there in this secret, intimate place, a hiding place, a refuge, a shelter. And of this, David is absolutely certain. Surely, he says, absolutely, without a doubt, this is my hiding place. I am secure. I am safe. No one can possibly penetrate the hiding place that God has made for me. Jehovah is a hiding place from trouble. And specifically from the floods of great waters. Thou art my hiding place, verse 7. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. And verse 6. In the floods of great waters, they shall not come nigh unto him. And trouble is anything in life which makes one's way narrow. That is the root idea of trouble, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, where it's usually translated tribulation. Something that squeezes and presses down upon you and makes your way uncomfortably narrow. And often, this narrowness or sense of being squeezed is caused by ungodly men who persecute God's people. And so often in the Old Testament, this word is translated enemies or adversaries. Saul was troubled for David. So was Goliath. Later, Absalom was troubled for David. And both Saul and Absalom made it clear to David by their actions that they wanted to squeeze David out of the earth. They made his way narrow. They said to David, as it were, there is no place for you, David, in this earth. Our aim is to crush you and to squeeze you and to make your way narrow. And that's what the wicked do to God's people in every age. They make our life narrow. Sometimes they cast God's people into cramped dungeons. Or they make their life narrow by not allowing them to buy or to sell. And finally, they say, there's no room for you in the earth, and they put them to death. And if we do not experience that kind of persecution yet, perhaps we never will in our lifetime, we don't know, we still face different kinds of persecution in the world, whereby the world makes our way narrow. Through mockery, through not including us in their various events, because in their view, we are too narrow. We would spoil their party, as it were. They make our life difficult. They curse us, they deprive us, and they say to us, there is no place for you in our society, among our friends, at our social occasions, because we want nothing to do with you. At other times, the trouble is impersonal, refers to those circumstances of life which make us feel that life is pressing down upon us and that our world is becoming narrow. And all kinds of troubles in our lives cause it to become narrow for us. There's pressure on us from the world and from the circumstances of our lives. Perhaps sickness makes our life narrow and under pressure. Perhaps it's a poor economy. We can't find a suitable job. We can't provide for our children and for our families. All kinds of difficulties will make our lives narrow. That's trouble. Life is full of pressure. The world calls it stress. David called it trouble. But the greatest of all trouble is sin. Not sickness, not poverty, not even persecution, but sin. And sin is the greatest of all troubles because it is self-inflicted. 
It's a trouble which brings God's heavy judgment upon us. And sin was emphatically, in the context of this psalm, David's trouble. Sin was the root of all of David's troubles, and sin is ultimately the root of all trouble in this world. Notice in Psalm 32, the context, the historical context here, David was not experiencing persecution at this point on in his life. So there was no Absalom or Saul or Goliath squeezing him at this point in his life. Nor was he experiencing affliction. Saul, his great persecutor, had died some decades before this psalm was written. Absalom, his next great persecutor, had not yet risen to become a rebel against him. His life, therefore, outwardly was relatively calm. He was the king of Israel, and God had given him rest from all of his enemies round about. His wife Bathsheba was going to have a baby. He was the king. He enjoyed riches. He enjoyed honor. But underneath the surface, as we saw already in this psalm, his life was in turmoil. Spiritually, David's life was a mess. Very troublesome. Walking in the way of sin, and God himself was making his way narrow. God was pressing down upon him. Pressure was coming to him from Jehovah God himself, and he felt crushed. And now David, after that experience of feeling crushed and having repented of his sin, and having said, Thy forgivest the iniquity of my sin, now he rejoices that the hand of Jehovah no longer crushes him, but is the hand which has delivered him. David learned the hard way that sin does not make life pleasant for a person. Sin makes all kinds of promises. Oh, if you sin, you will have freedom, you will have joy, you will have contentment in your life. Life will be so much more fun if you will sin. But David learned that no, sin brings trouble into one's life. Sin does not make you free. Sin binds and enslaves and pollutes. Sin, as it were, squeezes all the joy out of life. Because God will not allow sinners to have joy. He will not. They might appear outwardly to have joy, but God will not allow sinners to have joy, and God will especially not allow his own children to have joy as they walk in the way of sin. And so God had taken his hand, as it were, and had squeezed David until David cried out for mercy and came and confessed his sin. And he found that Jehovah was a hiding place and a refuge for him. The figure that David uses in this psalm about trouble is very expressive. The floods of great waters, verse 6. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Flash floods, sudden floods, were quite common in the Middle East, especially in the rainy season. And travelers who were caught unawares in the middle of a flash flood, a violent and sudden storm, would be in mortal peril. What will a man do? when the flood suddenly comes. An overrunning, overflowing flood of many waters comes suddenly upon him. Without a hiding place or a suitable shelter, the waters will sweep him away. And without Jehovah, the ungodly, worldly man, the unbeliever, will be swept away also. 
when floods of waters come to him, when floods of affliction, for example, come upon him, what shall he do when he becomes sick? And the doctor says, there's nothing I can do for you. There is no cure. When he loses all of his possessions, where shall he turn if he does not have Jehovah as his hiding place? And what will he do when he faces death itself? Because he does not have Jehovah as his hiding place. The foolish, unbelieving, ungodly man has no hiding place from these floods of great waters. He might trust in a flimsy shelter of his own making, but he and his shelter will be swept away in the flood of God's judgment. But of the godly man, everyone that is godly, verse 6, of that man, David says, in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. God's people have testified and continue to testify that when earthly circumstances are the worst, God shows himself to be the best. He provides much grace in the time when we need that grace. When everything has been swept away in our lives, so we're left with nothing, God is still our refuge and our hiding place. When God takes away a loved one, or sends a terrible sickness upon a loved one, or sends a terrible sickness upon us personally, we are not swept away. When God removes every earthly support from under us, it seems we cannot go on. God holds us up, and we are not swept away. The waters will not touch you. That's the promise of this psalm. They will roar threateningly. They will lap around your feet, but they will not come near unto you. They will not touch you. They will not harm you. And in Scripture, floodwaters are especially a sign or a picture of God's judgment. All you have to do is think of the flood of Noah's day. And God's judgment is coming. It's coming upon sin and sinners. And it is devastating. And it will sweep away all those who are not found in the shelter which is Jehovah God. All those not found trusting in the mercy of God, who are sheltering in some other flimsy hiding place of their own making, they will be swept away. The day is coming when God will pour out his judgment finally upon this wicked world. God will pour out his wrath. You read it in Revelation, for example, that the people in that day will cry to the rocks and the mountains to fall upon them and to cover them, but to no avail, because they will have no hiding place in that day from God's judgment. Here's Nahum, Nahum chapter 1. Verse 6, who can stand before his indignation and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a strong hold in the day of trouble and knoweth them that trust in him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof and darkness shall pursue his enemies. On the one hand, we have an overflowing flood, an overrunning flood that runs over the entire earth and destroys the people of the world. On the other hand, we have God himself as a refuge where God's people hide themselves and are saved. And Isaiah 28 verse 17 speaks about the refuge of lies, and that's the same word as hiding place in our text. The hills shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and waters shall overflow the hiding place. The flood waters are coming, and David knows it. David knows that God is the judge, but David is in the hiding place. The floods of judgment therefore pass him by. 
He has found shelter from the storm of God's wrath. Once it seemed, but a few months earlier, that God was intent on destroying him, pressing down upon him, and causing him to be utterly miserable in his sin. But David has found and wants us to know in this psalm that Jehovah God is merciful. And the shelter, who is Jehovah God, is the same God who once had chastised him severely. That same God, the God who is crushing him, is now the God in whom he hides and finds shelter. And David will not keep this to himself. He will tell the church of the Old Testament to whom this psalm was originally written, and he will tell us this evening as well through the inspiration of this psalm and through the preaching of this psalm this evening. He will sing about it. He will have us sing about it. He will teach transgressors how they can hide themselves from God's wrath because Jehovah God is the hiding place. He is the hiding place. He is the refuge and the shelter for all those who, like David, seek him in the way of confession of sin and experience his forgiving mercy. Those who hide in Jehovah God, according to our text, are the godly. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto you. And the godly are a separate category of people in the Bible in distinction from the wicked. Psalm 4 verse 3 says, But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Psalm 12 verse 1 says, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. Psalm 86 verse 2 says, Preserve my soul, for I am holy. That's the same word, godly. O thou my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. And a godly man is a pious, God-fearing man, one who is faithful and devoted to his God, one who loves God, the kind of person who will seek God and will find him, the kind of person who will pray to him and will find a hiding place in him, the godly. The godly man, in the context of Psalm 32, is the one who is sorry for his sin, confesses that sin, and finds forgiveness for that sin in the mercy of Jehovah. Because that word godly contains the word mercy. The godly are those who have experienced mercy, and therefore are those who exercise mercy toward others. And that explains why these, the godly, pray to God and why they find God to be a hiding place for them. They have already been recipients of God's mercy. The Bible tells us on every page that God is sovereign, that God is always first he was first in creation, and he's also first in salvation. The godly come because they have received the mercy of God, because God has worked in their hearts by his Holy Spirit. By themselves, they would not have come. By themselves, they are sinners who are afraid of God, who oppose God, who hate God, and who naturally flee from God. But God works in our hearts by his mercy, gives unto us new life, and so we come and we find the forgiveness of our sins. You might have thought, though, you might have expected even, that the psalmist would have written, For this shall everyone that is a sinner pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. But godly is the right word. Of course, 
is the right word. The Holy Spirit has inspired it to be this way. It's not true that everyone who is a sinner shall pray unto God. In fact, only certain sinners shall pray unto God. And David is a godly man. He had been godly before he fell into sin. He was godly as a child. He was godly as a young person. As a shepherd boy, when he was writing Psalm 23, he was godly. He fell into sin for a time, but now he's been restored and he is still godly. And so he gives hope to those who fall into sin. Have you fallen, says David, come to Jehovah, and you will find him ready to show mercy, ready to restore. Seek refuge, therefore, in him. And here we have the efficacious grace of God on display. Everyone, without exception, everyone who is godly shall pray unto the shall, they shall come to Jehovah God for shelter. And here we have the beauty of the gospel given to us in this psalm. God chastened David, caused him to be miserable in his sin. And now he calls this terrified sinner to seek a hiding place in him. The same God who sends trouble upon David into his life and upon his conscience so that David has no rest is the same God who now protects him from trouble and forgives his sins. The same God who sent floods of affliction upon David so he thought he'd be swept away in the wrath of God is the same God who brings him to repentance in the way of that affliction and delivers him from the greater judgment to come by being a hiding place for him in the storms of God's wrath. And how does he do that? Through Jesus Christ. Jehovah God can be one and the same, the one who sends great floods of judgment upon David and the one who delivers from those same floods of great judgment because of Jesus Christ. The floods of great waters came upon Jesus Christ. And then there was no hiding place for Christ because he had to be engulfed by those waters for David and for us and for all of God's elect children. Here are the words of Christ in Psalm 69 verse 2. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. And willingly, Christ waded into those waters of God's deep and terrible wrath. The billows of God's wrath overflowed him and engulfed him. And he did that as our perfect substitute on the cross. And because of that, those waters will not come nigh unto us. They will pass us by. Hide therefore in Jesus Christ. He has felt the fury of the waters of God's wrath. And because of Christ's cross, those waters will not come near unto us. And that's the confidence that David has in God through Jesus Christ. He knows his sins have been forgiven. He has that. He sings about that in verse 1. He knows his guilt has been lifted away. His iniquity has been removed. That God will not impute his transgressions to him. And therefore he knows that God can be his hiding place. That the just God can hide him from his own wrath. God has a just basis for delivering us from his wrath. The waters have passed over Jesus Christ, and so they cannot and they will not pass over us. In fact, it would be unjust if any 
anyone for whom Christ died were swept away by the judgment of God. And that's our comfort in the gospel of Christ. Christ died, therefore we do not die. Christ bore the burden of our sin, therefore the burden of our sin is lifted from us. Our sin was imputed to Christ, therefore it will not be imputed to us. He washed away our sin, therefore our sin has gone. And we with David and all the godly know and find Jehovah as our hiding place in the way of prayer. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Here is a prayer that we make. We pray for mercy. We pray for deliverance. We pray for safety. As we see the flood coming, we pray to God, God, save me. Deliver me. Protect me. And God becomes our hiding place. We hide in him and we escape from the waters. We have the incentive to believe that we can hide in Jehovah God because David hid in Jehovah God. And therefore, for this reason, everyone that is godly shall pray unto thee. David found mercy. We can be sure that we shall find mercy as well. No penitent sinner who comes to God in Jesus Christ, sorry for his sin, confessing without guile his sin to God, will ever be turned away from Jehovah. We ought not think that Jehovah God is too high and too lofty and too holy and too far away to hear our prayer and be a hiding place to us. Notice it says, when thou mayest be found, which means in a time of finding. And that's at all times. Those who seek him shall find him. Those who come to him in the way of prayer and confession of sin will find in him a shelter, a refuge, a secret hiding place where they can have intimate fellowship with God and where they are surrounded by the songs of deliverance which bring to them great joy. He is not far away. He can be found and he will be found. He is readily accessible and available to every penitent sinner. So come, says David, come to Jehovah through Jesus Christ. The floods of great waters overwhelm Christ's soul, but they will not come near unto us. They did not come near unto David. He found Jehovah to be his hiding place, and so shall we, for Christ's sake. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for the truth of the gospel that the bills of thy wrath and overwhelm the soul of thy Son Jesus Christ on our behalf, and so thy wrath will not come near unto us. We hide thyself in thee, O Father. We seek refuge in thee from all of our troubles. Help us, Father, to trust in thee have confidence that thou will always protect us and surround us with songs of deliverance. For Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. We sing Psalm 32, 6 to 11. 6 to 11. 